When I first heard that the crisis of the coronavirus would affect the gathering of our church on Sundays, my initial thought was to keep things as normal as possible. And that's the primary reason why last Sunday I chose to maintain my usual schedule of preaching from the book of Acts. And so we studied Acts chapter 19 concerning God using the Apostle Paul to invade Satan's kingdom in the city of Ephesus. And in the evening service, I preached as I normally would from 1 Corinthians. However, this week I've decided to do something different. In light of this ongoing crisis, I want to bring to you a message appropriate for the unusual days that we are living in. I want us to study both this morning and evening, and I hope you'll turn in, tune in on live stream this evening, Psalm 46. Because I think that what the psalmist says in this particular psalm is what we need to hear at such a time as this. As many of you know, because I've actually been saying this several weeks in a row in connection with our study of Acts, Psalm 46 was Martin Luther's inspiration for his wonderful hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And there's a reason why this psalm was so special to Luther. You see, as a result of being the man most responsible for igniting the spark that set off the Reformation, Martin Luther suffered greatly for his criticism of the Roman Catholic Church and the Pope. Having seen for himself the biblical truth that salvation was by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, Luther set out to challenge Roman Catholicism and its false system of man-made religion that emphasized salvation by works. But in doing so, this man paid a great price. He was under constant threat of his life. He was labeled a heretic. He was excommunicated from the church. And he was severely criticized even by fellow believers. And he was forced to defend his beliefs more than any other man of his generation. And all of this took its toll on Martin Luther. As Steve Lawson in his commentary on the Psalms points out, the year 1527 was a particularly difficult one for the reformer. Lawson explains what Luther faced during this very trying year. He writes, and I quote, after 10 demanding years of leading the Reformation, a dizzy spell overcame him in the middle of a sermon on April 22nd of that year, forcing him to stop preaching. Luther feared for his life. On July 6th, while eating dinner with friends, he felt an acute buzzing in his ear and lay down again convinced he was at the end of his life. He partially regained his strength, but a debilitating discouragement set in as a result. In addition, heart problems and severe intestinal complications escalated the pangs of death. What was worse, the dreaded Black Plague had entered Germany and spread to Wittenberg, Many people fled, fearing for their lives, yet Luther and his wife Katie remained, believing it was their duty to care for the sick and dying. Although Katie was pregnant with their second child, Luther's house was transformed into a hospital where he watched many friends die. Then, without warning, Luther's one-year-old son, Hans, became desperately ill. End of quote. Now, as a result of all of these trials upon him, Luther turned to the Lord with renewed a renewed sense of urgency, seeking refuge in God as his helper and as his strength. And it was during this time that Psalm 46 became so precious to him, so much so that he decided to turn the theology and the message of this psalm into the hymn that we know today as a mighty fortress is our God. It's one of the most familiar hymns of the faith, but just knowing something of the context out of which this hymn was written, I think it helps us to gain a greater appreciation for the meaning of the words. I want you to listen to the first and second stanzas of this hymn and imagine the great comfort and the great strength it gave Martin Luther as he battled discouragement and fear during those very dark days. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amidst the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal. Did we in our own strength confide, our striving 
would be losing. We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Just ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord Sabaoth, which means Lord of hosts, Lord Sabaoth, his name, from age to age the same, and he must win the battle. Now this morning and tonight, we have the great privilege of studying Psalm 46, the psalm which, upon which this hymn is based, and learning from it what Martin Luther learned, that Psalm 46 offers incredible peace, incredible comfort when life seems to be falling apart. See, just as this psalm gave the great reformer courage and strength to overcome his fears and not to panic in the midst of so many trials, so many struggles, so many battles, it'll do the same thing for you as you face ongoing challenges as a result of the coronavirus. And folks, the reason it will do this for you is because this psalm is uniquely designed and intended by God to evoke in us great confidence in him. And it's this confidence we have in him that gives us victory over our fears. I'd like you to notice just some of the truths about God that are revealed in this psalm that help us to trust him and not to succumb to our fears. For example, in verse 1, we read, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. So in the opening verse, God presents himself as our refuge and strength and someone who is always, always available to help us when we're in trouble. In verse 4, we read, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. Now, here we read that God is called the Most High, meaning that he's higher than everyone and everything else. Therefore, he is sovereign over everyone and everything else, even the most horrible of circumstances and those who cause them, even viruses that threaten our lives in our way of life. He's over them. He's the most high. There's no one higher than him. There's nothing higher than him. In verse 7, we read, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Here the psalmist refers to the Lord as the Lord of hosts, which means he's like a great army of many people. He, a host of people, and therefore he's strong. He's powerful. He's the general of an army of a great host of people. And in addition to all of these words that describe who God is, this psalm also tells us about what God does so that we don't have to panic, we don't have to surrender to fear. So we read in verse 6, the nations made an uproar, the kingdoms tottered, he raised his voice, the earth melted. So here we read that God's word is so powerful that he just speaks. He speaks and the nations of the world are defeated and they melt before his authoritative voice. Notice again, verses 8 and 9, Come, behold the works of the Lord, who has wrought desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots with fire. Now here the psalmist gives us a glimpse of what's to come in the days ahead, so that what we see in the future is that God will bring all wars to an end. And not because he's, he's good at negotiating and coming up with a peace treaty that's agreeable to both sides. No, that's not the point. The point is that he is so powerful that he will conquer all of his enemies and impose peace on them. And in that way, he will make all wars to cease. So it's quite clear from just this very quick surface glance at Psalm 46 that the writer of this psalm intends for us to see some significant truths about God and his power in order to instill trust, confidence in the Lord. But in considering these things, the natural question that we're forced to ask is, why does the psalmist tell us these things about God? Why does he go into such detail to describe God in this way as our refuge and strength and, and our helper, as the Most High, the Lord of hosts, the one who breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two? Why does he do this? In, in other words, what I'm saying is, what is the background of this psalm that led the psalmist to write these things about God? Well, no one knows for certain the precise background of Psalm 46 because the psalmist doesn't tell us the historical setting out of which this psalm was written. All we know from the heading above the psalm is that it was written by one of the sons of Korah, 
for the choir director in the temple, the temple in Jerusalem, meaning that it was a song to be sung by the Jewish people when they gathered to worship. And when it was sung, it was to be set, we read, to Alamoth. So, of course, what does Alamoth mean? Well, again, no one knows for certain. But since the word Alamoth in Hebrew is related to the term for young woman, it probably has to do with singing that was accompanied by soprano-like instruments. In other words, highly pitched musical instruments. But even though we haven't been told the specific historical setting of Psalm 46, it's rather apparent that it was written soon after an amazing deliverance was brought about by God concerning the city of Jerusalem. You can see this very clearly from what the psalmist tells us in verses 4 through 6. He says, There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations made an uproar. The kingdoms tottered. He raised his voice. The earth melted. Now, what is described here, folks, is an attack that was planned against the city of Jerusalem, which the psalmist refers to as the city of God, because that's the place where God said he would dwell among his people. And it's this attack from the Gentiles, some foreign nation that has made a great noise, The psalmist calls it an uproar. But their uproar has come to nothing. Why? Because God was in the midst of Jerusalem and he saved his people and he saved the city. And he did it by raising his voice and defeating this foreign power. Now, since no one knows for certain the historical background of this psalm, we also don't know with any certainty the specific battle and the divine deliverance the psalmist is writing about. However, and it's a big however, What most reputable Bible scholars believe is that what the psalmist is referring to here in Psalm 46 is the time when God dramatically destroyed the armies of the Assyrian king Sennacherib in the days of the Jewish king Hezekiah. That's found in 2 Kings chapters 18 and 19. And the best evidence for this is that the prophet Isaiah used similar language language as the psalmist uses in predicting the overthrow of Sennacherib's army. Now why is this significant? Because if you recall from the story that's told in 2 Kings 18 and 19 about the Assyrian army coming against Jerusalem, the situation facing the people of that city looked absolutely terrifying and absolutely hopeless. We read that Sennacherib sent to Jerusalem his field commanders who stood before the walls of the city and called out to the leaders of Judah, as well as to the people. They called out that they are to surrender because they had no chance against this powerful army. Remember, this was, at that time, the greatest empire and army in the world. In fact, their their words were absolutely bone-chilling. They were meant to unnerve. They were meant to terrify, to horrify the people. Listen to some of the things they said, the field commanders, the generals said from 2 Kings 18. After the Jewish leaders told the Assyrian generals to speak to them in a language that the people listening would not understand because they didn't want the people hearing their words and being horrified by their threats, here's the response of the Assyrians. Verse 27. But Rabshakeh said to them, has my master sent me only to your master and, and, and to you to speak these words and not to the men who sit on the wall, doomed to eat their own dung and drink their own urine with you? Then Rabshakeh stood and cried with a loud voice in Judean, saying, hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you from my hand. Nor let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, the Lord will surely deliver us, and the city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah, for thus says the king of Assyria, make your peace with me, and come out to me, and eat each of his vine, and each of his fig tree, and drink each of of the waters of his own cistern. Until I come and take you away to a land like your own, a land of grain and and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive trees and honey, that you may live and not die. But do not listen to Hezekiah when he misleads you, saying, the Lord will deliver us. 
Has any one of the gods of the nations delivered his land from the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the guards of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharvium, Hina, and Eva? Have they delivered Samaria from my hand? Who among all the gods of the lands have delivered their land from my hand that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem from my hand? Chilling words. Now, essentially what he was saying is that it's no use for your king to pray to your God because God is not going to help you. None of the gods of the other nations that we conquered helped them, and your God is too weak also to help you. So if you don't surrender to us, you're going to starve to death so that you'll turn to eating your own dung, drinking your own urine just to survive. Folks, these are horrific words. Words that were intended to emotionally destroy and crush the spirits of the people, to put panic, to put fear into their hearts. And in response, the scriptures tell us that Hezekiah, the king of Judah, prayed to the Lord for deliverance, and God answered his prayer through the prophet Isaiah by telling him that Sennacherib's army would not attack Jerusalem and that the city and the people would be spared. And God fulfilled his word in a very dramatic and a very remarkable way. We read in 2 Kings 19, starting in verse 32. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he will not come to the city or shoot an arrow here. He will not come before it with a shield or throw up a siege ramp against it. By the way that he came, by the same he will return, and he shall not come to this city, declares the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it. For my own sake and for my servant David's sake. Then it happened that night that the angel of the Lord went out and struck 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when men rose early in the morning, behold, all of them were dead. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and returned home and lived at Nineveh. So what we read here is that God did defend the city of Jerusalem by killing 185,000 Assyrian soldiers with some type of plague that took their lives in just a matter of hours. Now, folks, the reason this is important for us to, to see the situation that Jerusalem faced is because the writer of Psalm 46 appears to take this very terrifying situation to teach us the great truth that when we face our own worst imaginable situations, we don't have to be fearful, we don't have to panic, we don't have to be alarmed, because God, the God of Jacob, is there to help us, and he alone is who we should seek to protect us and to strengthen us. See, the message of this psalm is that there is no reason to ever be afraid, not if you know the Lord, because no matter what calamity might come upon you, God is very present He's a very present help in your time of trouble. Whenever that trouble and whatever that trouble might be. In other words, a mighty fortress is our God. And he is always available to help his people so that when you are tempted to be afraid, you can run to him anytime and find shelter in him. Now this psalm and the truths it teaches are critically important for us to know, especially in these days of uncertainty, because fear is something we all struggle with, and Psalm 46 tells us how to deal with our fears. In addition to the many fears that, listen, we, we ordinarily, under, under the best of circumstances, we tend to struggle with fears concerning our health, fear of having enough money, fear about losing our jobs, job security. All these things still exist. And they loom even larger because of the threat of this virus and the global upheaval that it's brought. Well, fear is a very real temptation for us. But listen, whatever fears you might have, the answer to them is found in Psalm 46. Because it's in this psalm where we are taught why we don't ever need to be afraid. You see, two times in this psalm. The writer makes a very bold statement that even when facing the most devastating circumstances imaginable, he and the people who have learned what he has learned about God will not be afraid. This is a bold declaration by this man. 
First, in verse 2, he says, therefore, we will not fear. And then in verse 5, he says, concerning the people of Jerusalem, we will not be moved. In other words, we will not be afraid, and we will not be shaken, and we will not tremble, and we will not be unnerved, regardless of what we face, regardless of how bad things may look or get. But listen closely, because... Behind these bold statements about being fearless and unshaken, the writer of the psalm tells us why we don't need to fear and why we don't need to tremble and panic when the world around us is collapsing. That is to say, he gives us some very solid, very tangible reasons as to why you and I don't need to be afraid of anything, even the most devastating of circumstances. And these reasons for being fearless are presented in this psalm in the form of three truths about God designed to eliminate our fears. This morning, I want us to look at the first of these three reasons, and tonight, we'll look at the other two reasons. And I do hope that you will listen on live stream at 6 p.m. tonight, even if you don't usually come to our evening service, because these truths are so important for you to know at such a time as this. Listen, it's not like you can go out for dinner now, so you might as well watch us on live stream and see the whole picture. It will encourage you. It will help you. Now, the first reason the psalmist gives for why we don't need to be afraid is because of who God is. Who God is. Verse 1 says, God is our refuge. And strength, a very present help in trouble. Now, the psalmist begins the, his song, and it is a song, as you know, the psalms are, are songs, by telling us three things about God's character. All of these things he tells us are in terms of his relationship to us. First, he tells us that God is our refuge, which means that he is the one who shelters us from danger. He is our protection, or as Martin Luther put it, he's our mighty fortress, In other words, he's the one we are to run to when we find ourselves in trouble. In fact, the Bible says that running to the Lord when we are in danger, finding our security in him, that's one of the things that characterizes true believers. And it distinguishes us from unbelievers. I say that because of Proverbs 18, verse 10. There we read, the name of the Lord is a strong tower, the righteous runs into it and is saved. The righteous is just a a synonym here for believer. A believer runs into it and is safe. The inspired writer says that when a believer is in trouble, his normal response is to immediately turn to the Lord and to trust him, casting his care upon him. This isn't the way non-Christians face danger. Notice the very next verse in Proverbs 18, verse 11, which gives us the contrasting behavior of a wealthy unbeliever. We read this, a rich man's wealth is his strong city and like a high wall in his own imagination. In other words, while believers run to the Lord and we put our trust in him and we find in him all for our security, unbelievers don't do that. They put their trust in in their wealth or some other item, imagining that it will protect them from danger. But it's only in their imagination that this is the case. It's not real because it never does protect them or give them true security. So God is our refuge to protect us. He's someone we run to, someone we find our safety in and our security in him. Secondly, the psalmist tells us that God is also our strength, meaning that he's the one who gives us our strength. He's the one who enables us to go through the trials of life. The Apostle Paul said that he could do all things through Christ who strengthens him. See, God alone is the one who gives you the inner strength you need to endure even the worst of circumstances, the worst of tragedies. I can't tell you how many times I've heard Christians in the midst of some tragedy say, I don't know how any non-Christian goes through something like this. And it's true. Believers go through tragedies by the enabling grace that God gives them. But unbelievers don't have that grace because God is not their strength, and so they just try to cope with things as as best they can. So God is our refuge who protects us, and he is our strength who enables us to withstand the fiery trials of life. Third, the psalmist tells us that God is a very present help 
in trouble. And by trouble, he's referring to being in a situation where you can see no way out. And I say that because the Hebrew word for trouble, it means cramped. It means narrow. It means restricted. It means to be put in a narrow, confined space with no way to really get free. The way we would put it today is something like this. It's being between a rock and a hard place or being in a tight squeeze. And the comfort for every Christian is that when we find ourselves in one of these tight binds, we can rest in the fact that God is there to help us because he is a very present help, meaning he's always available to help us whenever we are in trouble. This is precisely what the writer to the Hebrews was referring to when he said in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, Therefore let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. There's never a time that God isn't available to help you. Never. Always available. This is who God says he is. He's our refuge. He's our strength. He's our helper. But the question is, are you applying these truths to your life? See, it's very easy to forget and and fail to apply these truths about God when we're going through a crisis, isn't it? Very easy. It's so natural to act like unbelievers act by putting our security and our faith in all kinds of human devices and substitutions like our bank accounts, our retirement funds, our ability to think our way through jams, out of jams, our, our resourcefulness, our physical strength, our intelligence. But all of these things will always fail us because they just can't protect you from disasters. Nor can they give us strength in a crisis. Nor can they help us when we're in a tight bind. And those who think that these things can accomplish all of that, you're just being delusional. You're deceiving yourself. Even our government, as hard as they are trying to protect us from the spread of this virus, and we ought to listen to them and follow their directives, still, they must not be the object of our faith or our security. That alone is reserved for God, because He alone must be our refuge, our strength, our helper. In addition, one may know these truths about God and heartily agree with them without personalizing them. I suspect that this is true of many of us. See, it's one thing to affirm it, to affirm that in a theological, it's theologically correct or in a theological context that it's right to say that God is our refuge, our strength, and our helper. But it's quite another thing to affirm this by putting into practice that he is your refuge, your strength, your helper. Concerning this tendency to believe these truths about God in in sort of a detached and impersonal way, merely in a theoretical manner, the noted preacher Charles Spurgeon said this. He said, forget not the personal possessive word, our. Make sure each each one that you say he is my refuge and strength. Neither forget the fact that God is our refuge just now in the immediate present as truly as when the psalmist penned the word. God alone is is our all in all. All other shelters are shelters of lies. All other strength is weakness. For power belongeth unto God. But as God is all sufficient, our defense and might are equal to all emergencies. Good words by Charles Spurgeon. Third, it isn't enough to know that God is available to be your refuge and strength and helper. You must make a conscientious effort to relate to him as your refuge, your strength, and your helper. In other words, you must seek him in the midst of this crisis, turning to him in prayer, trusting him to protect you, strengthen you, help you. This is why Proverbs 18 verse 10 says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runs into it and is safe. The righteous runs to the Lord as quickly as possible because he knows that only in the Lord is there safety and true, genuine security. So, my question to you is, are you doing this? Are you running to him these days, spending time in his word, 
fervently praying to him for his grace, casting all of your cares upon him, casting all of your fears upon him. That's what you must do. That's what God wants you to do. And if you do this, you will experience, folks, the reality of what this psalm tells us about God, that he's the one you can turn to and find shelter from this present danger, that he's the one who will give you strength to face this crisis, that he's the one who will help you in the tightest of fixes when all human solutions fail. See, what the psalmist is concerned about is that this wonderful information that he's given us about God, he's concerned that it be applied and be a living reality to those who read his words so that when we do face a crisis, we will turn to the Lord and respond to him as our refuge, strength, and helper. It becomes evident that this is the psalmist's purpose in telling us these truths about God because of what he says next. Notice verses 2 and 3. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change and though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride, Selah. Now, based on what what he's just told us about God, the psalmist makes an incredibly bold conclusion. Here's his conclusion. Therefore, as a result of knowing these truths about God, We will not fear. And then he gives a picture of a worst case scenario in which an earthquake of historic proportions comes and wipes out entire mountains so that they come crashing down into the sea, causing the waters to roar and foam with tidal waves. Now, what is the psalmist saying? Well, watch this. He's saying that knowing that God is our refuge, our strength, our helper, we will trust him even if our world comes crashing down on us. See, he's not predicting that there's going to be an earthquake of this magnitude, but only that if something like this were ever to happen, some natural disaster that was a national crisis, we still would not be afraid. And the reason we would not be afraid is because we know God as our refuge, our strength, and our helper. Just a few weeks ago, something like our present crisis happening seemed unthinkable. While an earthquake of historic proportions hasn't happened, it sure feels like that, doesn't it? I mean, something like that. Because our entire world is reeling from the effects of the coronavirus. Far from being a national crisis, we're experiencing a global crisis of unprecedented proportions. And so in light of what we're experiencing right now, based on the inspired words of verses 2 and 3, here's my coronavirus version of these verses. Therefore, we will not fear, though a deadly virus should sweep through the earth, killing thousands, transforming entire nations. We will not fear, though this virus disrupts our very way of life, and we will not fear, though it roars and foams and threatens to unleash its deadly terrors on us. Selah, think on these things. See, folks, here's the point that the psalmist is making. Just think of the worst thing that could happen to you, and then ask yourself if you could trust God in that worst-case scenario. If you're a Christian you should be able to say, yes, certainly, by God's grace, I know I would and I can trust him because I know who God is and what he's like. And therefore, I am prepared to handle any crisis, personal, national, or global. And the reason you're prepared for the worst imaginable crisis is because you know that you can trust God to protect you, to give you his strength, to to help you in the tightest of squeezes. In other words, if your world ever fell apart, you are prepared not to fall apart because your trust is in the Lord. What we have to keep in mind is that God is greater than the forces of nature. He's sovereign over life and death, over our health, over viruses, over our economy, over our way of life over the decisions made by government leaders. He is sovereign. 
Therefore, in any crisis, we can trust the Lord to protect us, to strengthen us, to help us. None of this took him by surprise. Saying something similar to my coronavirus version of Psalm 46, verses 2 and 3, one Bible teacher had his own version. He said, though the basis of all things visible should convulse, though the most solid and stable of all things created should shake or fall headlong into the sea, our God remains steadfast and faithful. There is no earth, earthquake of any sort, whether natural, moral, physical, financial, or spiritual, that can shake us out of his loving arms. Listen, nobody but God knows what the future will bring. No one knows but God how long this crisis will last. But he is sovereignly, sovereignly in charge of all things pertaining to this crisis. He is still on the throne of the universe. And he has sent it into our world to accomplish his purposes, whatever those purposes might be. Therefore, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, then you don't have to panic. You don't have to succumb to fear. You are to apply what you have learned today and calmly trust God and believe him for who he says he is. He is your refuge. He is your strength. He is your helper. That's who he is. And that's why after verse 3, we read this one lone word, Selah, which means to think about this, to consider this, to ponder this truth, because these are truths about God that you just can't dismiss and go eat lunch and forget about them. These are profound truths that must be thought about and then applied to your lives. And so you must, these, this is a command from God, Selah, think about this, ponder these truths, contemplate them, apply them to your life. Mull them over in your mind. Let them be absorbed into your very being. So I ask you, what is your relationship with Jesus Christ like in these days as you go through this unique crisis? Are you a believer in Jesus, but one who's full of fear, full of anxiety, afraid of all the changes that are altering your life every day? If that's the case, then you need to admit your fears. Honestly, admit your fears to the Lord. And then you need to confess them as sin and not excuse them. You need to confess them as sin. Then, with the faith that God has already given you, because if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, He has given you faith to trust Christ for salvation. You then have the faith to trust Him for everything else. You need then to cast all of your cares, all of your concerns on Him. Start looking to Him as your refuge, your strength, your, your helper. Folks, this is what you must do. This is what you must do. It is a sin to worry. It is a sin to not trust the Lord. It is a sin to be fearful. He's given you the grace. He's given you the truth to trust Him. So do it. You can. But if you do not know Christ personally as your Savior, your Lord, then fear is very likely your way of life these days. And it's very reasonable for you to be fearful. But you don't need to be because the Lord can be your refuge. He can be your strength. He can be your helper too. And he will become this to you, but you first have to run to Jesus Christ for eternal salvation. Because he offers to be your refuge from something far more dangerous than the coronavirus. He offers to be your refuge from the eternal wrath and judgment of Almighty God because of your sins. This is why Jesus died on the cross. He was judged by God the Father in, in, in place of those who would believe in him for salvation. So believe in him. Which means trust him, put your confidence in him, rely upon him and his substitutionary death as the sole basis for your salvation from God's judgment. Flee, the Bible says, from the wrath to come by running to Christ as your refuge from the fury of his wrath and judgment. I'm going to pray in just a few moments. Joel is going to come to close us in a wonderful song that 
that I hope will encourage you. But before he does, I, I, I want to urge you again to tune in to tonight's live stream at 6 p.m. because we're going to fill out this psalm. You're going to see it in its fullness. There's much more to go in this. It'll be, it'll be a great comfort to you. It'll great, be a, of great encouragement to you. It will give you peace to see all that God has said in this psalm. There is a reason why Martin Luther was so taken up and taken by this psalm, it'll have the same effect on you. Will you join me in prayer? Father, we thank you. Thank you for what your word says, Lord. Your word is settled in heaven and no virus can disrupt it. No government rule can change it. Your word is settled. You are our refuge, Lord. You are our strength. You are our helper. We thank you that you change not. We thank you that great is your faithfulness. Lord, I pray for our people who are isolated from each other, but not isolated from you. I pray that what has been taught to them this morning will be taken and absorbed into their very, the very fiber of their thinking and will transform the way they think by renewing their minds and they will find that that. These truths are truths that they apply to their lives. I pray, Lord, for great comfort, great encouragement to come to our people, the Lakeside family. And I pray, Lord, with the contacts, whatever contacts we have with the outside world, with unbelievers, help us to demonstrate that we are trusting in you, that we have great peace, that we are rejoicing, even giving thanks in the midst of all of this for, as you said, to give thanks in Christ Jesus. That is your will in Christ. So, Lord, we thank you for in the midst of all this that you'll accomplish your purposes in all of this. We pray that you'll draw those who are watching, who do not know Christ, draw them to yourself that they might come to the end of themselves and come running to Christ for salvation. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.